Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, political scientist at Loon University. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. In this episode, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Solomon Messing, who is one of the best when it comes to computational social science research methods. He's currently a chief scientist at Acronym and an affiliated researcher at Georgetown University, uh, but he's also founded the Data Labs at Pew Research Center and was a principal research scientist on the core data science team at Facebook. So in this episode, we're going to dive into different aspects of Dr. Messing's work, but with a particular focus on data science and data analytics. We'll cover some things around what his research is showing currently at Acronym, which is a nonprofit that seeks to benefit progressive campaigns and causes. Uh, we'll talk about some of his prior research, and we'll also talk into some of his work around differential privacy and releasing the Social Science One data set around Facebook URL sharing. So altogether, a fascinating interview. We cover a lot of ground. But without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Solomon Messing. Again, he's a chief scientist at Acronym and an affiliated researcher at Georgetown University. Dr. Messing, thanks for taking the time out and welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I'm a, I'm really happy to be here. I'm a big fan of the show. So uh, thanks for having me on. Awesome. Great to hear. And I have a ton of questions for you, but I want to keep a through line on data and data analysis across the various industries you've been working in. And to start out, going back uh, 10 to 15 years, you were already working with NLP and machine learning at Science Applications International, which provides IT services to government clients. So can you describe how you got into using computational social science methods and how these methods have changed since you first started using them? Yeah, so I actually got my start at SAIC writing these qualitative reports on on misinformation and propaganda that was sort of popping up on these internet forums around the world. You know, back then, that was kind of what social media kind of was all about. You didn't have much uh, in the way of Facebook, Twitter, or kind of modern social media. And so one day, we had these government clients, and they asked for metrics. And we were sort of like, well, what do you mean metrics? <laughs> and we didn't have budget for statistical software. So instead of going out and buying, you know, SPSS or Stata, I ended up kind of getting paid for a year to learn R. And back in 2006, that was a lot harder. Like it was a lot harder to get started in data science because there were just, there, there wasn't much out there in the way of tutorials. There was no sort of stack overflow. Google back then treated R as a letter not as a programming language, right? Huh. So you, you couldn't Google bugs in your code? I mean, you could Google the text, of course, but yeah, it was, it was much harder to just find stuff. Um, we didn't have a great development environment either. Like there was no R Studio, there was no Tidyverse to make data munging easier. And I was the only one in the office who had done much time at all in CS. I was sort of half, half of my undergrad career at UC Santa Barbara was as a CS major. So I was one of the few folks who was actually even willing to take this on. So I started working with native speakers to kind of hand label documents. You know, you might use that today to start off on some kind of machine learning journey. But we were actually just using that to get a sense, to get a handle, a quantitative sense of kind of what kind of misinformation, what kind of propaganda might be out there. So actually, like one of the key methodological differences between stuff back then and stuff today is that we have social media, which has some biases, but it's so much richer in terms of the data that you can get that characterizes the analysis of any kind of social behavior, phenomena, et cetera, that plays out online. So I started to, to get into more computational work soon after that kind of made its way through the rounds. I was doing this sort of word embedding approach, this early word embedding approach called latent semantic analysis, right? And it sounds so fancy, but really like, <laughs> it's sort of like saying when you compare this to, to stuff like GPT-3 and the latest NLP technologies coming out of labs at Google and Facebook, et cetera, it's sort of like saying, hey, bro, uh, 
nice Tesla. By the way, I was playing with these electric cars that had a remote control back in the 1990s, <laughs> right? It's a qualitatively different thing to be clear, but it's definitely still part of the same kind of family of semi-supervised NLP approaches. But what's available today is just nuts, right? Like you can do so much more. Folks have come up with really clever ways to deploy this sort of underlying structure that, that GPT-3 and, and models like that really capture and integrate them into analysis, integrate them into computing technology. It's really meant a, a big increase in what's possible for researchers and technology companies, right? So the most important thing I think for researchers there, though, before, before we move on, is that it's become much more modular, right? You've got transfer learning, which means that researchers like you and I can take the models that the big dogs have already come up with and tweak them a little bit to what we want to use them for. So for example, at Pew, Pew Research Center, my team tweaked this 50-layer convolutional neural network called ResNet50, which is sort of an image classification network. And you just you tweak the last layer of it just a little bit to figure out whether you know account profile images or image search results contain men or women. And that allowed us to do this really cool large-scale research project on gender representation online. Yeah, well, that leads very well into my next question. I think it's interesting that you've you know developed these tools and then apply them mostly in, in a research context uh, to the extent that you founded the data labs at Pew Research Center, which kind of brings in computational methods to add another dimension to their traditional survey research. And we've covered some of those reports on the show. And I'm curious, with Pew's mission to be nonpartisan and unbiased in their reports, how did you approach kind of setting out guidelines or protocols to conduct this computational research given the biases? and online data and sort of how we interpret it. Yeah, that, that's really tough. And, and the short answer here is, is that the real work at Pew with Data Labs was less about formulating those guidelines and more about designing rigorous research that asked a meaningful question, the kind of question that Pew really excels at answering, which are descriptive questions about the world, like really important facts about the world that might be kind of not fully explored by quantitative academics who are really focused on causal inference these days. So it was about design. And then could you actually collect the data to answer the question that you had posed? And then the guidelines and the standards there would fall out kind of of the approach to get the data, right? Like if I were, if I were talking about text, there's a lot of questions about how you collect text as data, how you form a sampling frame there, how you do content analysis and supervise machine learning, right? And so you have this little tidy data set that you can actually then analyze for insights that people are going to find useful. So there's a longer answer too, if you want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, that's what podcasts are for. <laughs> okay. So that's to say that online data has been getting really a lot better because we spend more and more of our time communicating like this digitally. And I'm sure everyone is kind of particularly aware of this right now, given the pandemic. But I think the reason that Pew founded Data Labs is because they recognize this possibility, right? And that's why they invested so much into the Data Labs group. And so when my career was getting started, social media was just not useful to study social science, to study these important questions. And it, it certainly wasn't at the point where you'd see the technical ecosystem surrounding social media that we see today, right? So today, like, it's used by everyone. It's used by everyone in the media. It's used by politicians. It's actually really useful to study certain facets of politics and public opinion, right? And it's become especially important under our current president. I mean, if you know how to use it right, it can really serve as a tool of tremendous influence, even for, for ordinary people, and a tool of social change. So... I think that, you know, there's there's obviously some people out there who see declining response rates for surveys, which is Pew's bread and butter. And then they think that, well, one day maybe we're going to be able to replace polling with some fancy analysis of social media content, right? And that's just missing, that's missing the point. The point really is that this data, social media data and, and you know, other data sources, they allow us to collect data that just didn't exist previously to study things that are new. You know, for example, you study elite behavior, you can study social structure. You could never do that before. And not not in the same way anyway. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm thinking about um 
you know, th- there was a time before the newsfeed, right? And then maybe, you know, Facebook data was useful for anthropologists or cultural sociologists. But I think once the public agenda started showing up in people's feeds and then elites started, you know, having professional presences on the platform, then it becomes much more interesting for, for uh, political scientists to study. I think that's true. But also, you know, one of the things that, that drew me to Facebook when I was getting my PhD in the first place was the ability to study just the structure of social ties, the study of information flow as well as kind of elite behavior, as well as the way that news media diffuses across that network and, and the way that that I'm not qualified to study this, but the way that, that that leads to cultural change. Right, because you were a principal research scientist at the, uh, the core data science team of Facebook. And um, part of your job there was doing civic engagement work. And so can you outline some of those more kind of political oriented projects that you did at Facebook and in particular how social science methods fed into that work? Yeah, yeah. OK, so first of all, I was fortunate enough to, like I sort of alluded to a second ago, to finish my Ph.D., while maintaining a relationship with the company. And out of that came two research papers I'm pretty proud of, right? One, kind of the flow of political content across the platform among Democrats and Republicans or or folks who had a sort of left-leaning or right-leaning ideology, I should say. And another, which is an experiment that exposed folks to more news content in the lead up to the 2012 election and, and showed effects on turnout and uh, consistency of policy preferences after. But I, I think maybe you're asking more about the work that we that we did to encourage constituent communication on the platform. And that, yeah, that was definitely informed by the work that I did with Justin Grimmer and Sean Westwood at Stanford on constituent communication. You know, we took a lot of the lessons learned there. We also did structured interviews. We sort of had this blend of political science theory and interviewed staff, congressional staffers, We realized that one of the biggest barriers to fostering interaction between members of Congress and their constituents on social media is that members just have no idea who's a genuine constituent and who's just trolling, right? And and there's been a lot of work on trolling members of Congress and what that does to representation and what that does to their incentives to communicate with people on platforms. And so what we did is we created this constituent badge that then Facebook could validate and we saw we saw interaction go way up. It's interesting, we saw interaction go up among the folks that had the badge, but also to some extent among members uh, with those constituents as well. Um, So we were pretty proud of that. And so I also worked on this pretty high visibility effort called Social Science One, which which Mark has actually thrown his support behind. And that was a massive challenge, right? You got to create this huge data set. You got to set up the system to analyze it. You got to learn all about privacy technology. You got to make sure this data is actually useful to social scientists and that you don't do something stupid and, and, you know, mess up privacy. So that was, that is just all social science right there. But that's also interfacing with kind of executives and high level folks at Facebook and uh, a fairly famous academic, you know, academic famous is different than famous famous, but, you know, famous (laughs) academics to make sure that, you know, everyone is, is happy and in the loop and, you know, we're sort of making progress and that everyone's as happy as really like they could be. That was a, you know, that project took a long time. Yeah. And I want to, I want to get to that looking at differential privacy and, and URL sharing and also some of your research. But before we get there, I want to ask you a bit about your current work at Acronym, uh, which is a nonprofit that has the mission of building a better infrastructure for progressive campaigns and causes. And that's basically all I know about Acronym, aside from the fact that they do a lot of ads on social media from their super PAC. Uh, so can you outline the type of work you're doing at Acronym and why you decided to join that after Facebook? Yeah, totally. Okay, so I'll start with the with the first question. So, so I've been I've been actually talking a lot with James James Barnes, and we had worked on some of that civic engagement work that we just talked about uh, back in 2013 at Facebook. And he's an interesting character. He was actually embedded in the Trump campaign in, in 2016, and I saw him go through a lot of pain. And uh, so he went through a lot. He he left Facebook in 2019. And eventually, eventually came to Acronym. He reached out to me a few times, and he wanted me to help him build this team dedicated to assessing the impact of digital and political strategy for not just Acronym, but for the entire uh, 
community, right? The entire progressive community. And so I eventually joined and we, we put together a team of, of what I would call crack data scientists and, and engineers. These are folks who spent time at Google and Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, you know, a team of, depending on how you count it, seven-ish people. And what we do is we run field experiments on Facebook on around a 10-day cycle, which is very, very fast, faster than, than that works in academia for sure. <laughs> we also run in-survey message testing. We're doing a bunch of projects using machine learning uh, to complement that work. But we, kind of, we also advise on organization-wide messaging strategies and tactics that are based on kind of the latest and greatest science on persuasion and data that's available. So what state should we, should we be in? Right, acronym does spend money. There's a super PAC behind it. It spends a lot of money, actually. And what audiences might we want to focus on and kind of what messaging might work the best? And so we also know a lot about how social media works, right? Because when it comes to advertising and social media, there's a lot, there's a lot that's different from conventional TV or even conventional search. So, you know, I, I think it's almost conventional wisdom at this point that Facebook's good for raising money from small donors. But there's a lot of additional factors, especially when you're when you're trying to deal with persuasion or mobilization, that are a lot less obvious, right? So, so the way that the Facebook ad auction works is that you tend to reach the most engaged people first, and you're never going to persuade those people, right? Because they're already either totally for you or totally against you. And there's been some academic work that shows that when you advertise on Facebook, that's who you tend to to reach. You tend to reach the folks who are who are either predisposed towards your message or just super engaged already. That is, unless you tell Facebook to do things differently and spend money in a certain way when you're sort of advertising and, and to spend a certain amount per person to reach the entire set of people in your potential audience. There are a bunch of tricky things related to the algorithm. There's also a bunch of simple things too, right? The kind of, the kind of ads that work best on TV are just not compatible with the medium. Uh, you got to produce much shorter videos. Basically, if you don't produce a video under 15 seconds on Facebook, your ads just aren't going to be shown on certain ad products. Uh, and even if you're doing that, people also consume content in a way that's very different from TV. We're finding, for example, that you know animated infographics and promoted news content from other news providers are just uh, a much better fit just a much better fit for the medium. And they result in more consistent persuasive effects, hmm. which is, you know, I find, I find super interesting, but there's other, okay. So, so like there's, there's this message is the medium thing happening here, but there's also, there's also a lot of reasons that promoting news as social scientists, we might expect that to work better than a political act. And that has a lot to do with the source of the message, the messenger, right? Who is saying something matters a lot. It's something that that I think we don't think about enough in the in the politics space. And look, I can find news about a conservative who's who's saying something super critical of Trump. I might even be able to find that in, in Fox News. And I can put that statement in front of a moderate audience. And that matters a lot, right? If an in-group member or an in-group source is criticizing one of their own, that criticism could be taken a lot more seriously than if a a liberal political advocacy group is laying down that message. It's also a lot cheaper, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> to amplify someone else's content versus your own. Versus taking the, the time, the money, the effort to produce your own content. Yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. Now, because you're in the know on this, I'd like to ask you about, we've talked a lot about Facebook and um, it's interesting to hear about a little bit of these backend dynamics. Uh, what about Instagram? You know, sort of 2016 was its first kind of foray into into political advertising. But um, do you think that will play a bigger role here? I don't know if you can share news content the same way or advertise it on, on Instagram. Yeah, well, the, the thing about Instagram is it really unlocks your ability to reach a younger audience, which for us, for kind of the, the progressive side is quite important. You know, we've also seen Instagram as, <laughs> as a vector for misinformation, and I think it's important to, to make sure that as many folks are on the platform as possible so that we're providing a counterpoint to that misinformation. Because if the experience shows anything, the, the best way to, to kind of counter misinformation 
is not to directly counter misinformation, but to get the truth out there before people even kind of absorb it. Right. Inoculation, basically. Yeah. Interesting. So kind of more more specifically, yeah, we are on Instagram. Um, the the ad formats are, are not quite as broad as what you can do on Facebook, but you can still do a ton on Instagram. And it's it's an interesting medium because it's so visual. It has a bunch of, of interesting sort of things that, that we don't generally do, we don't always do with political ads. And again, those those kind of like, I don't want to say boring, but the kind of straightforward infographics uh, are seeming to, to work very well on that platform as well. Hmm. Yeah, I've seen that on politicians' Instagram pages. They seem to be putting out a lot of poll numbers or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, and, and you know, I've done a bunch of research on, on the effects of, of showing people polls as well. <laughs> and yeah, like it just goes to show you that these little chunks of information that you might not think twice about can really shape the way that people think and behave, especially folks who, who might not be inundated with this stuff like you and I are. Right. Um, and I wanted to ask you something you alluded to a bit earlier, um, given the situation around the, the pandemic, um, because you've been working you know, so much with uh, online data and social media data, and the fact that this is you know, being generated more and more because people are at, at home on their phones and obviously the election is, is getting closer. Do you think that the pandemic makes online data more valuable this election cycle or does it just create more noise for what's really important? Ah, uh, well, we have a program to mobilize young and non-white voters. But other than that data that's going to come out of that project, it's very difficult for me to see any kind of empirical silver lining at all here, right? When I think about the lack of physical campaigning that we're seeing, it's hard not to immediately worry about the very, very real consequences for democratic, big D democratic politics, right? Total registrations, new registrations, which skew left, they've just dropped off a cliff since March. There's just a massive imbalance also between who wants to, to vote by mail uh, and who wants to vote in person by party, you know, folks who who tend to be Biden supporters, the, the numbers that you got put out there on this are, are staggering. Like something like 70% of them want to vote, vote by mail, and 14% of Trump voters want to vote by mail. I get more concerned every day about our capacity to handle in this deluge of, of mail in ballots that's coming. And we've seen tremendous difficulty, I'll put it that way, in Georgia. We've seen a lot of folks standing in really, really long lines across the country. Texas is 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 not seeming to be very friendly to, to mail-in ballots, except for folks who are, I think, over 65. Then the president seems to be undermining the legitimacy of mail-in ballots, and at the same time, the postal system's ability to deliver them. You know, finally, you, you see that the Trump campaign is doing in-person canvassing while the Biden campaign hasn't knocked on any doors, you know, at least according to the, to the latest news from Politico. So if you're trying to allocate resources, run a campaign, in that sense, it's definitely going to introduce more noise, right? We're in more states than I think would be normal in a non-pandemic election. I suspect the Biden campaign is going to do the same thing. Mm. Now, switching gears a bit, because I do want to talk about uh, about some of your research and some of your kind of reflections um, on your experiences there. I mean, you've done you know so much work with these sort of social media metrics, whether it's likes on political pages or people's self-reported political leanings on their profiles or URLs um, to examine phenomenon like cross-cutting exposure, polarization, um, ideological inference from this data. And so what I'd like to know or what I'm curious about is – from a social science perspective, which of these metrics do you find to be uh, most useful in studying political processes on social media? Are some more inherently useful than others? Yeah, so that's that's interesting. That's an interesting question. I, I like news, right? As as <laughs> your listeners might have already guessed from our conversation, and I think one of the most consequential uses of social media is when people are sharing the news with their friends. I mentioned that big boosted news study with Facebook. And at acronym, what we're what we're seeing again is is to come back to this is the biggest persuasive effects seem to come after showing people news, uh, especially among folks who are sort of less engaged or, or less high on our political knowledge metrics. So I, I mean, like in some sense, you could say 
that yeah, it's it's new shares that I really like to to analyze. But really, the key metrics here, the key outcome metrics, are survey measures of attitudes and maybe real world behavior, particularly here at acronym. We want to see if what we're doing increases voting and increases Democratic vote share. Because mm. I I, I want to. This is a self-interested question because I'm working on something related at the moment. But uh, in one of your earlier studies with uh, Sean Westwood back in 2012, um, you were looking exactly at this, this this news engagement across partisan lines. And the argument from that study was that uh, Facebook likes, if the story had Facebook likes, people were more likely to select that news regardless of whether it was partisan leaning, so from Fox or, or MSNBC. And since then, a lot of studies have argued that likes don't seem to matter. They've used things like uh, eye tracking to see that people don't tend to look at likes when they're they're selecting news. And so I'm wondering, do you think that there's, um, you know, for some of these quote unquote shiny metrics like Facebook likes, uh, do you think they may lose some significance over time as people become more accustomed to their presence on the platform? Yeah, I think so. I think I think it's very, very possible that, that that's the case. You know, Kevin Munger has kind of famously argued that as platforms change and, and as people change and, and as culture changes, findings from just a few years ago might might not be relevant anymore. And I think people now know that media content is especially kind of prone to have uh, strange things happen with like counts. Um, you never know the denominator when you're looking at the like counts on media content, right? And I think particularly if you're looking at a, at a media page, so this gets to kind of a subtle distinction, but there are kind of two ways that people might encounter news, particularly on Facebook, but also on Twitter and other social networks. One where the news source itself, you follow them and they are releasing content. And then there's like, if your friend posts a link to news media content, and I suspect that there's kind of a, a very different way of browsing for each kind of encounter, right? Where if your friends are sharing something, it means something very different. And people, I think, have learned at this point that, at least on Facebook, the count of people who like that content comes from your kind of friend network rather than from this sort of mysterious either. Right. But that is the friend part is the hardest to replicate in an experimental setting, right? So it's a bit tough to uncover. Well, so so Sean and I actually tried to to do this, and we were we were successful in 2012. And and, and Facebook has since made a bunch of changes to the API, uh, thanks to Cambridge Analytica, that no longer allow us to do this. We had we had put together a essentially a replica of Facebook. We allowed folks to log in. They gave us this sort of this key, and um, I can't remember what the what the authentication system is called anymore, but Basically, they said, yes, like you can have my Facebook data for research. We rendered a replica of their Facebook newsfeed and, and kind of randomly inserted content ostensibly shared from their friends and were able to kind of see the, the, the differential selection rates between friends and, and news sources. Unfortunately, at the time, they looked pretty similar because I think that was just when Facebook had rolled out the ability for news organizations to reach individuals and and not just that individuals saw news content shared by their friends. But we did see, for example, that closer friends had a much higher selection rate than what we call weak ties than folks we don't know well. We were able to estimate that based on the the number of common interactions they they'd had together. You could do a lot with the Facebook API back in, in 2011. It was a very different world. Very different world. Yeah, I think a lot of us didn't know how to code back then, so it would be a, it would be a, a tall order. Exactly. But um, I want to switch gears here and talk about differential privacy in our kind of. Speaking of which. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, uh, exactly, um, because you know it, this relates to the the most directly to the Facebook URLs data set from Social Science One, and there's a lot of a grumbling around the uh, you know academic community about the amount of shares that would be required in for URLs, but. I, I've read the paper on, on differential privacy, and it's uh, first of all, it's a little bit over my head in terms of all the, the algorithms and, and statistics. But uh, but I want to ask you about about that because reading that paper did sort of 
make me realize the difficulties in um, and actually making these these data sets sort of robust and really protecting users' privacy. So could you describe for us what differential privacy is and some of its key benefits and weaknesses for research data sets? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so it, it has been a while since since I've been working on differential yeah, privacy. And it's a big question. <laughs> and, and this is this is a big question. So uh, I'll do my best. Okay, so differential privacy is a way to provide essentially plausible deniability to anyone that's in that data set uh, that they're actually not in the data set, right? That's one way to think about it. Um, another way to think about it is that if I'm an attacker, right, if I want to find out information about you and I have a bunch of data on you, but I want to learn something new from an ostensibly de-identified data set, right, where you've scrubbed the PII, but you still have kind of the structure of the data fully in, intact. What I might be able to do is I might be able to say, okay, I'm going to look for a row in these two data sets that's unique and identical. And I'm going to infer that that's the same person. And so there was, you may remember from a few years ago, someone did this for the Netflix prize data set, right? They actually broke the privacy protections in the Netflix prize data set using data that they had collected from IMDb. Mm. Yeah, so, so differential privacy prevents that from happening, essentially, with some uh, very, very high probability. Right. Okay. And I'd like to ask you about that, that plausible deniability factor in a second, because I think that's, that's, that's the most interesting. But, but first, um, when I was reading the paper, one of the things that really struck out to me was the role of mathematical proofs uh, in these systems. And if I understand the logic correctly, it's that these systems should be derived from mathematical principles without sort of first looking at the data uh, to identify certain thresholds around, you know, how much user activity should be should be held back. So, how does that work? Why build these privacy systems from mathematical proofs rather than the kind of specific properties of the data set? Well, right. So, <laughs> ideally, that's the way you, you do it. But in practice, what you really want to do is you really want to try to, to get a sense for this trade off between utility and privacy protection. And utility is much harder to try to, to quantify, to reason about mathematically. And so often what happens is folks tend to, to say, well, I want this level of privacy protection for the data set, and that's the only thing I'm going to think about. And then later, <laughs> when researchers or analysts or scientists go to try to analyze that data, they find that they can't actually use it for what they wanted to, to use it for, whether it's detecting some effect or measuring some quantity uh, or anything like that. And so, yes, ideally you want to say, yes, we're going to start from first principles, choose the level of protection in these systems, add a certain amount of noise to every query uh, that gets released, add a privacy budget to prevent repeated querying to remove the noise, and... That's just what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And w I'm, I'm trying to figure out the, the the plausible deniability logic as well. And I don't know if I have this right, but um, the way I read it, and I understand there's different levels of granularity of, of the privacy, um, but would it go something like this as a practical example? Like if somehow you were able to identify a trend that this person tends to share, let's say conspiracy theories or whatever it is, you would be able to give that person enough plausible deniability that even if even if you said this data tends to show that you do this, this is the trend, you would never be able to pin down an exact example of that person sharing the content. So you always give them a sort of yeah, plausible deniability or a backdoor to say, that was not me who shared this, but the overall trends show that you tend to share this data. Yeah, that's exactly right. But you raise a really interesting point which is that this kind of doesn't really work for really high dimensional data sets. You can't, this is good for kind of the census. The census is using differential privacy. Um, but this, this is not going to work for text. We're not at the point yet where we can provide differential privacy 
for text data sets. And that's why in uh, Social Science 1, we didn't make text fields available because... I.e. comments, right? It's Yeah, it's just too hard to ensure that something that is as high dimensional as text isn't going to have a bunch of unique rows. And so to add enough noise to analyze that effectively would, would, I think, just not... It might not even be possible, first and foremost, but it would probably obscure any kind of text analysis you might want to run. Okay, so like, what's the biggest problem when you add noise to a data set? It's power, right? You're going to have a, a problem with power, potentially. And power is something that we struggle with a lot across the social sciences. So this is one of the, the real potential costs or, or downsides to differential privacy. Mm. Anything high dimensional, anytime you need additional power, you're going to have some serious difficulties. Right. And this is outlined more in depth uh, in the paper that I'll link to uh, in the show notes. But um, my last question has to do because you sort of the paper is a, in a sense, a sort of a set of guidelines or a recommended steps or sort of key features that one of these differential privacy systems would have. And you argue that there should be three main layers, a user interface layer, a privacy layer and a data access layer. So could you explain how those layers fit into uh, the broader system and like what would be an actual workflow uh, for a researcher acquiring this data set? Well, so, okay, let's start with the the, the user flow, because I think that's maybe a little easier to, to kind of think through. Sure. And the way that this would work is a user would essentially log into a remote computing system, run, well, before they actually run any queries, they would think very carefully about the kinds of questions they want to ask of the data. Um, and the reason that's the case is because the more queries you run, the more you use your what's called your privacy budget, which is there to prevent you from asking infinite queries in a sort of clever kind of way to, to de-bias, denoise your queries and, and actually re-identify someone in this protected system. Okay, so you want to very carefully design your research questions, your, your queries to match those questions, and then you run your query, apply some kind of post-processing analysis that would account for the noise that's been added to the data and uh, probably add some kind of correction. Gary King's written a paper on kind of how to do this in certain circumstances, and then write up your findings. So that's what the researcher would see. And under the hood, what's happening is that the user is interacting with this sort of user layer, right? This user interface layer, which is probably a SQL-like system. And that system is hooking into a privacy layer in a very secure way, that privacy layer is doing all the computation on the raw data that's in some database system to add noise in just the right way to query results to then display them to the end user. And then, of course, in the data layer at the core of this system is a protected, probably a separate set of data that is somehow distinct and physically separated from the most sensitive data that whatever data sharing entity might possess. Does that sound comprehensible? <laughs> yes, it does. And it yeah. reminds me of, I don't know, going through a spaceship and unlocking <laughs> different chambers <laughs> to get into. But it, but it yeah. makes sense. And it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I think if you, if you read the paper, then you really get a sense of, of how complex and how kind of yeah, logically driven uh, the, these these ideas are, and it'll be interesting to see if if this is uh, sort of the future model for for how to uh, analyze this data responsibly. Yeah, thanks. And so I also want to encourage folks to read the actual data documentation for that URL's data set because <laughs> we've actually put an insane amount of work into that documentation, probably more work than I've put into most papers that I've that I've that I've written and published. So make sure, <laughs> make sure to have folks read that as well, if you don't mind. Well, I think those that are still with us will probably be most likely to uh, to read that, <laughs> read that document because we have covered a uh, a lot of ground. But uh, Dr. Messing, thanks so much for for taking the time out and sharing your insights with us. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Michael. Much appreciated. <laughs> 
I've just been speaking with Dr. Solomon Messing, chief scientist at Acronym and an affiliated researcher at Georgetown University. You can check the episode description for a link to that paper on differential privacy. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time, I'll be speaking with Vanessa Moulter from the Stanford Internet Observatory to talk about Chinese influence operations online and offline. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Alma. See you next time.